We have a great lineup of speakers today from existing hubs all across the country and uh, who all are a part of a network called the Building Performance Partnership or BPP. And they'll be sharing some insights from their respective jurisdictions and telling us about some of the things that they're working on um, just to give you an idea of the value that a building performance hub can provide. All right, there's our, there's our beautiful speaker lineup. So we're excited to hear from all of these speakers today. Um, just a few logistics to go over. So first of all, we would love to take your questions. So we have IMT Senior Associate of Business Engagement, Ella Wetlitson, moderating our Q&A. So just throughout, drop your questions into the Q&A box and uh, we'll address as many as possible, both throughout and at the end of the presentation. Also, be sure to follow along. We've got Mary monitoring our chat. And um, there's going to be just some fun and helpful information in there, including links to some resources. So you're going to want to keep an eye on the chat. And um, just a quick note, uh, you will be receiving a follow-up email um, over the next week or so with the webinar slides, the recording and contact information, and a brand new hot off the press uh, resource that will provide some really uh, excellent guidance for anybody interested in hub creation. All right, so let's take a quick look at our agenda today. So at first, we're going to get a brief overview about what a hub and the BPP, or Building Performance Partnership, actually are, followed by each of our speakers who are going to talk about the work in their respective hubs. Um, and just a note, you're going to see some similarities between the hubs, but you'll also see how they differ based on the special needs of their uh, geographic locations and regions. Um, so then at the end, we're gonna take, as I mentioned, some time to answer your questions from the Q&A. Okay, so before we jump in, we're gonna do uh, take a quick poll. So we've got a polling question for you to respond to. We'd like to get a sense of who is in the room. So uh, please just let us know, take a minute and check the box that uh, makes the most sense for you so we can uh, see who all is in the room today. Great, we've got uh, a little bit of everyone, but uh, excited to see local government, nonprofit, and other. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you so much for that. Oh, and one last thing, to have a little fun along the way and to get to know each other, uh, I'm gonna be asking our speakers to tell us what their favorite podcast is. Uh, that way, you know, we can all make a great list of some fun things to listen to. And you guys can also drop your favorite podcast in the chat. Um, I, I'll start with mine. So my husband really wanted me to tell you that my favorite was his podcast, HR Stories. But just between us, I don't think you can hear me. Just between us, I'm going to go with Smartless. I'm a Smartless girl. I find it highly entertaining. What can I say? All right, so with that, let's jump in. And our first speaker today is Katie Schwamm from the Building Energy Exchange in New York, or BX. Fun fact, BX and IMT are partner organizations in supporting the BPP. So Katie will give us an overview on what a hub actually is and the value of the BPP, and then will give us an update on their current work in New York. So welcome, Katie. And um, Katie, before you start, tell us about your favorite podcast. Sounds good. Thanks, Marla. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Katie Schwann, Director of Educational Resources at the Building Energy Exchange in New York City. I'm very excited to be part of this fantastic event and panel of speakers. And I'm going to use this opportunity to do a shameless plug for Radio BX. Uh, it's a podcast that we develop out of our hub here in New York that features conversations with experts and leaders working at the intersection of buildings, energy, and sustainability. So be sure to check that out. Um, for our discussion today, I'm going to get us started by providing some insights into high performance building hubs, including what they are, why they're important, and about the growing network of local hubs that are being developed across the nation through the Building Performance Partnership. So what is a hub? Simply put, it's a center of activity. Uh, specifically, a high performance building hub brings together key decision makers like owners and investors, architects and construction professionals, 
uh, so they can understand and help accelerate the transition towards high performance buildings. Hubs do so by providing a one-stop shop for resources on topics critical to that jurisdiction and community, such as panel discussions on the latest energy codes uh, or performance standards, workshops on financing strategies, uh, case studies that spotlight success stories of deep energy retrofits, and so on. Essentially, a hub provides industry members with critical and actionable information in one convenient location. A key attribute of successful hubs is that they are flexible and responsive to the needs of their local community, since each city and region has its own unique priorities, challenges, and regulatory environment. And uh, uh, we'll get some insights, as Marla mentioned, from different hubs on how they are supporting their own communities uh, when we hear from the rest of the speakers. Now, the value of a hub comes from the fact that they bring people together. Uh, those various decision makers uh, that impact buildings that we mentioned, um, they are often siloed and can have communication barriers. So hubs provide a mechanism to convene and connect these various groups by acting as a neutral and trusted entity that can facilitate knowledge sharing and collaboration. And on the topic of building relationships, there's also an opportunity for hubs uh, across the nation to become a network of hubs. And this is where the Building Performance Partnership or BPP comes in. Through BPP, IMT and BX support the creation and operation of high performance building hubs. Essentially, the BPP acts as a hub of hubs, just as a hub itself connects groups and supports the exchange of information and ideas at the local level, so too does the Building Performance Partnership by connecting hubs across the nation to share resources, lessons learned, and other critical information. So what if you're interested in starting a hub where you live? The BPP provides a framework for hub development that involves key phases. Initial phase includes needs assessment and uh, strategic planning. This is a vital step to determine the specific needs and knowledge gaps. It's important not to presume, uh, but to take the time to understand aspects of that specific community, including its policies and goals, state of market, building stock, et cetera. Um, this phase also provides an opportunity to begin identifying strategic partnerships and audiences, as well as funding strategies. For hubs that move into the launch phase, the BPP provides services to help establish the hub itself, such as branding and communication support, website development and resource creation, prioritizing content that's most impactful based on the needs discovered during the assessment phase. And as the hub becomes established, BPP provides ongoing support, including additional resource um, creation, as well as a peer learning from the network of other hubs. Um, so the new hubs essentially get a leg up. They can learn from those who have come before in order to accelerate the positive impacts that the hub can make in their own community. And as Marla mentioned, we'll be distributing a guidance document that provides more detail about the BPP and about how a hub might be an asset to your community and jurisdiction. So I'm gonna shift gears slightly. Uh, I'll take a quick moment to talk about the Building Energy Exchange in New York. So BX was born out of the Bloomberg administration and his team's focus on the environment and specifically on sustainability in buildings. In New York City, buildings generate around 75% of the city's GHG emissions. And to address this significant environmental impact, they established the Greener Greater Buildings Plan, which was a comprehensive set of energy efficiency laws mandating strategies such as annual benchmarking of energy and water use, retro commissioning, lighting grip upgrades, et cetera. So BX in New York, in essence, was created as a way to provide carrots uh, to those regulatory sticks um, and to help the real estate community comply with these new requirements and achieve their own efficiency goals. So we worked to establish ourselves as a resource and trusted expert to the building community uh, some resources that we offer include our physical space, uh, which has classrooms and exhibit area and event space, which are not only helpful for showcasing the work that we do, 
but also are an incredible asset to our industry and community partners, which helps strengthen those relationships. We also have a robust website, which is accessible to anyone, anywhere. Uh, some features include our extensive resource library with reports, case studies, recordings of live events and whatnot to date, uh, as well as tools such as BX Ed, our online learning platform, which houses um, on-demand courses and trainings. We are very excited to share this information with everyone. So even though content has been created with a bit of an eye towards New York, Many of the tools and resources are relevant to the industry at large, uh, so be sure to check those out. Now, uh, one final point that I, I would like to highlight is the fact that BX was established under a particular regulatory environment. Even though it was, um, the hub itself has become even more critical as new and more advanced policies and standards are being enacted. For example, in 2019, the city passed the Climate Mobilization Act, which established increasingly stringent carbon emissions limits um, on most buildings over 25,000 square feet. Non-compliance means that building owners could face financial penalties. Uh, we've been able to help the community understand and prepare for these new mandates because of the previous work we've done and through the lessons that we've learned along the way. And we're continuing to keep close tabs on the evolving industry needs and forthcoming regulations so that we can continue to serve our community. And with that, I'll pass it back to Marla. Thank you so much, Katie. That's amazing. And um, yeah, I can uh, uh, attest to the fact that there's amazing resources that BX has and uh, so many that anybody can use. So thank you for sharing that. And I can't believe I didn't even know about the BX radio podcast. That one's definitely going on my list. All right. So now we're going to travel from New York down to Washington, D.C., uh, who was actually the first jurisdiction to pass a BPS. So we're going to hear from Teresa Backus, who's the director of the D.C. Building Innovation Hub. So, Teresa, before you get Hi. started, what is your favorite podcast? That's a great question. So it was funny when I was thinking about the answer to this question, a few podcasts came up and I thought those are probably not appropriate to say on the webinar, but there are some really hilarious podcasts out there. Um, one of the ones that I find really entertaining that is appropriate to talk about is called Let's Argue About Plants. Um, it's a fun podcast for plant geeks like me and the, the tips and the tricks are really accessible and interesting. Um, but really it's a reminder for me that as we, we think about our built environment, buildings and landscapes should really be connections. They should su support and they should serve because buildings and landscapes, after all, are for people. So that actually brings me to my presentation. As Marla said, um, I'm the director of the Building Innovation Hub here in DC. And I'd like to share with you today some of the problems and the struggles that we're trying to solve here at the hub, as we call it and also how we engage with stakeholders to hear what they need, um, how we, we use this process to inform our resource creation. And that is all in order to help the cities achieve these very ambitious yet necessary climate goals. So the DC Building Innovation Hub is a program of, of IMT and we were created to help make connections and provide resources in order to achieve equitable building performance policy outcomes. So we actually launched about two and a half years ago in 2020, learning a lot from the great things that BEX is doing to support the nation's first BPS, as, as Marla just said. Um, and in this short time already, we've supported almost 1,600 buildings, and that includes 90% of the buildings that are currently not meeting the district's building energy performance standards. So we exist very intentionally in this middle space between the government and the industry. And we are a part of a really wide ecosystem that supports everyone through the District Department of Energy and the Environment. So you can see that includes the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, the DC Green Bank, um, many other DC departments, and also, of course, many private sector companies who are hub members and also partners. And I see some of you on the phone today, so it's really great to see you. Um, we are quite literally a hub of connection to build, build um, ambition and bridge ambition and action. So prior to launch, we conducted an industry survey. And that's that's some of the, you know, I think the 
learn that we'll talk about later, but we conducted a needs assessment. We did numerous interviews, and this is something that we continue to do on a rolling basis. And so we hear and have heard that DC, and this is like any other city, has challenges and hurdles to overcome. But there are also so many opportunities in all of this, and that's where a hub comes in. We help the industry, we help communities, and we help government to overcome challenges and, and really shift this view of buildings from being a problem to solve to being an opportunity for economic inclusion, prosperity, and resilience. So how do we connect ambition and action here in DC? Um, we link people, organizations, buildings, resources, services, and we help make decisions and we help people act on those decisions. So as I said, we're very intentionally in this middle space and we have a very broad mission and many goals. And some examples of how we do that are, are programs that we've created to help individuals in a very detailed and customized capacity with understanding the regulations, such as the DC um, Building Energy Performance Standards. So the programs that we have go beyond our many webinars, our events, and our resources that we have posted to our website, one of which is called Success with BEPS, and another program is called our Building to Vendor Matchmaking Service. So our Success with BEPS program was launched about 18 months ago, and it is intended to provide one-on-one -on -one support to under-resourced and priority buildings and their teams. And what we do through this service is we review benchmarking data for accuracy, we, we meet regularly with the building teams, we provide resources and next steps related to the BEPS. And the, the goal of this service is to help get buildings off the starting block, so to speak, and really position themselves for long-term success with the building performance standards. And then our, our vendor matchmaking service is a program wherein we connect local service providers, contractors, and um, energy efficiency experts with the buildings, with the buildings that are looking for help with all things related to building performance and capital improvements. So the BEPS, of course, but also energy audits, retrofit work, commissioning, ESG planning, you name it. And we help, we help in particular small and disadvantaged businesses connect with more project opportunities and we also help these buildings find qualified vendors. So really it's a win-win. Um, one big challenge that we hear, that we have heard and that we continue to hear is equity and job opportunity. The building sector at large, but more specifically in the green and high performance building work, um, renewable energy infrastructure and associated trades. So what we're doing um, and working to overcome that challenge, we're doing so in a few ways. So we have a focus on procurement and workforce development, and we're, we're continuing to build out that workforce development focus um, right now with the help of my colleagues um, at the Hub. And some examples include, like I said, our vendor building, building matchmaking service, but also we have a procurement guide and we have our high road contracting templates and guides. So our service procurement resource is a step-by-step -step guide that helps building owners make decisions about how to improve the operations and energy efficiency of their buildings, but also achieving and focusing on triple bottom line solutions through their contracting and by using their economic power. So the result we believe is a better building and a stronger brand that returns the value to a building's bottom line. And you can see in the, in the roadmap that it overviews the entire process and it breaks it down into nine steps that, is, that are very detailed as to about, or should I say why it's important, how to make it happen and then where to find additional help. Um, our high road contracting standards are something that I'm really excited about um, because uh, high road contracting refers to a business standard of productivity and also efficiency, but one that's rooted in environmental sustainability, living wages and shared prosperity and inclusion. Um, these standards are, you might know, that are embedded in many public sector projects and RFPs. Um, but they rarely exist for private commercial building owners. So our resources were developed with Emerald Cities Collaborative for the district's building industry. And they include things like RFP templates, um, building owner resources, contractor response templates, et cetera. And as I mentioned, we're now working to further build out our strategy for how we can support workforce development and economic opportunity, both through the local BEPS, but, but also much more broadly. So there's lots of really exciting things to come. So this is just a small sample. It's really hard to cover, you know, many years of work in, in a few minutes, but we offer many things as a hub and we're um, a wealth of resources and services that are intended to be tailored to everybody that's involved in the building process. So I encourage you to reach out. We'll have our contact information in the chat and we're happy to help you with anything that you might need. Back to you, Marla. Thanks so much, Teresa. 
This is great. And I think y'all are starting to see like, uh, again, the, the amazing resources uh, that hubs have and services and the connections. Uh, you can already start to see this theme. And so you can understand how helpful this could be for any building owner or contractor or anybody that's in a, any kind of a policy environment. So uh, that's awesome, Teresa. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so now we're gonna head over to St. Louis. And next up is Malachi Ryan, the director of the Building Energy Exchange, St. Louis. So hello, Malachi, thanks for joining us today. Do you have a favorite podcast? That's a really hard question. Um, I think I have to say that I have a friend with the Missouri Botanical Garden, Jean Ponzi, who is one of the most charming people that I know and a pillar of our local sustainability work. She puts out a podcast called Earthworms. So I'm really happy to give her a shout out. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Marla. Again, my name is Malachi Ryan, and I'm the director of the Building Energy Exchange St. Louis, or BXSTL. As you know, we're here to talk about how high-performance building hubs catalyze action. As we pivot to the Midwest, it's important to spend some time talking about where to understand how. I hope that this helps both communities in our region that haven't yet engaged with us connect to us, but also other cities who look like us to see that a hub can succeed for them too. The greater St. Louis metropolitan area is the 20th largest in population size in the country. We are a bi-state area anchored by the confluence of two of the world's greatest rivers, the Missouri and the Mississippi. On the east side of the Mississippi, what we call the Metro East, is the second largest metropolitan area in Illinois. On the west side in Missouri, the show me state, is the world famous skyline home to the Gateway Arch representing our mid continent place as the doorstep to opportunity, the gateway to the west. The city of St. Louis, the small independent county in the center, once the nation's number four, hit its peak population around 1950. Today, the population within that boundary is less than half of that at around 300,000. We know suburbanization and urban decay. The population center isn't the city any longer. St. Louis County, neighboring on the outside, holds just over 1 million people, especially with 90 unique municipalities over two counties equal to the nation's 10th largest city. The implementation of high-performance buildings needs a connector. The city of St. Louis implemented benchmarking requirements in 2018 and was once again the fourth in the country when they launched their building energy performance standard in 2020. Both ordinances cover buildings over 50,000 square feet. These programs are administered by the building division through the Office of Building Performance and an appointed Building Energy Improvement Board. The city's choice of site EUI, utility-related data, makes for easy conversations and buy-in across the community. Targets are based on local data and set at the 65th percentile across 20 building categories. They are the only municipality in our region currently with these ordinances. If we agree that our cities have their own cultures, attitudes, and vernacular, I think that we can also agree that the things our friends in New York and DC have shared, the benefits of improving buildings matter here too. Like them, our goal is to connect the people who make decisions for buildings with solutions and resources to create healthier and more comfortable places to live, work, learn, and play while saving money and increasing value. BXSTL formally launched in March of 2022, but the work had taken place over several years. We represent collaboration with many regional organizations in Missouri and in St. Louis who learned from the examples shared by members of this group. Our parent organization is the Missouri Gateway Green Building Council. Missouri did it together. Organizers in Kansas City linked with St. Louis, creating a parallel cross-state effort that strengthens us today as the first state with two independent hubs. Ashley will speak to you shortly about BXKC, but we have an elevated place at the table in regional conversations. More than that, sharing our different, differing local focus and expertise expands our combined capacity and helps us grow. Her work routinely inspires me. But how do we generate action? We have to engage with building decision makers where they're at. People own buildings to serve a purpose. They are focused on their goals and priorities and sometimes envision this work as big extras. The first piece is project development, helping people start the work and make better decisions about scope or retrofits, including project and equipment choices is the core goal of our owner operator series. We want to answer tough questions that become hurdles while connecting people directly to services, expertise, incentives, and ways to increase traction within their planning. 
Often the synergies will reduce or remove existing problems and catch up on deferred maintenance. In the end, they get the rewards of doing the work. Their building supports their goals better and has more market value. These conversations can help with BEPS compliance, but they are just as valuable for anyone else in the region. It serves our goal to be regional support for this work. We are here to encourage and empower, which includes celebrating local successes. It isn't a straight line from our built environment to a perfect one. Each owner, building, situation, and purpose create pathways for successes and hurdles for implementation. When we notice that lower income nonprofits, small businesses, schools struggle to get the process started, we have to ask how we can help. We took the idea of an energy audit and with partners have asked if there was any way to provide meaningful professional feedback, but remove overhead from a traditional audit. We are currently testing a remote audit offering to do just that. All right, understanding and deciding that you wanna do something may not be enough to actually get it off the ground. We also have to create a project pipeline by working directly with the building industry, a and &E firms, contractors, and the workforce to find solutions and create expertise for the hurdles of project implementation. The beauty is that if done right, this creates a circular economy where everyone wins. We're developing a service directory to bridge the divide between decision makers and the industry. The city of St. Louis is in the first cycle of the performance standard. Learn with us, be inspired, inspire us. So. If like us, you don't have all of the pain points of expensive property and utilities, if you don't have state codes, but you have high building emissions, you have the infrastructure of people and industries past, if you have families choosing food or electricity, you can do this. Just like us, I bet you have vibrant communities, people, businesses, amazing cultural institutions and heritage, so much good worth looking at. And if you have municipalities that aren't all working on BPS, they still positively receive the hub and our work is just as impactful. Should any of them adopt BPS, knowing that we are here is of some real comfort. We are akin in many ways to the challenges of our neighbors, but also to those who are much farther away. Here in St. Louis, we're a collection of cities and stories. We are rust belt, snow belt, salt belt, but equally as important in this conversation, not just because we are all in this, but because as a city, as a region, as people, we are worth investing in. In everything that I've described, there is the undercurrent of a great future. We and you can continue to be a gateway to opportunity. Thank you. Back to you, Marla. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Malachi. I'm like, I'm so inspired. I'm like, sign me up. Let's do this. That's amazing. I also, I love that you use the words empowering wins. I, I just feel like that is such a great des descriptor for the hub work in general. So thank you so much for that. That's amazing. Um, okay, it's time for our second polling question. So we just want to take a minute to understand, you know, kind of where you are. Like, do you, do you have any interest in a hub in your region? Um, or do you have a hub already? So if you could just take a second and uh, check the box that applies. We'll just give you a moment and then we'll see our results. How could you not be interested in a hub after what you've heard so far? Already connected? Okay, great. Great. All right. The good news is are just not too much in the no category. So that's uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for your participation in that. Um, okay, so now we are going to go over to Kansas City. We just, uh, Ashley just made a little guest appearance on Malachi slides. So <laughs> now we're going to go over to Kansas City uh, to hear from Ashley Sadowski, the director of the Building Energy Exchange in Kansas City. Um, Ashley, before you get started, can you tell us about your favorite podcast? Yes, totally unrelated to the subject matter, but my favorite podcast is You Might Know Her From, which it features interviews with female actors in film and television and theater. It's brilliant and heartfelt, and it's a great celebrity gossip fix. So that is my recommendation. Hey, everyone. My name is Ashley Sadowski. I am the director of Building Energy Exchange KC. We were established almost two years ago to represent the Kansas City region. We are an initiative of Climate Action KC, and we work in partnership with the Mid-America Regional Council, which is our local regional planning organization. We similar to some origin stories, came out of a regional planning effort to define a climate strategy for 10 counties across the metro. 
covering both states of Kansas and Missouri, the Regional Climate Action Plan was created with the support of over 150 elected officials and 1,000 volunteers. It established a greenhouse gas inventory, which showed that 63% of our emissions are directly attributed to buildings. This really set the tone that if we were going to move the needle on climate in our region, that we had to meaningfully engage with the real estate sector. So from that vision, Building Energy Exchange KC was established in 2021. In identifying where we could bring the most value to this conversation, we recognized that our local real estate ecosystem is fractured and currently unable to facilitate widespread adoption of building energy improvements. Understanding the limitations of our current ecosystem is critical. Access to the benefits of energy efficiency, clean energy tech, and climate resiliency are limited and inequitable. We are seeing city policies develop since the adoption of the Regional Climate Action Plan. This includes the adoption of the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code and significant growth of wind and solar in both states, though we do not have a building performance standard on this side of the state line. Um, but priorities around housing affordability, racial equity, and high wage jobs remain at the top of the list for most of our community members. Our duty as a new local institution is to find ways to move the needle on building emissions while also embracing these priorities. We must advance the energy performance of buildings in ways that positively impact health and wealth. So how do we do that? And what does this work actually look like? So over the past two years, we've given over 80 presentations to a variety of public and private stakeholders with the intention of building diverse, multidisciplinary partnerships that can create the technical, financial, and workforce needs to catalyze high-performance buildings. We seek to demystify the value and practices of high-performance buildings through site tours and educational workshops. The picture in the upper left is a site tour of a project in downtown Kansas City called Second in Delaware. It is the world's largest passive house project with over 276 apartments, and it consumes 90% less energy than surrounding buildings. At this event, we have the mayor of Kansas City speak about the value of energy efficiency, and the development team laid out the business case for why this project became the new bar for how they develop. The event was attended by building owners, public officials, and real estate leaders. The combination of political support, investment storytelling, and in-person experience was powerful in shifting perspectives. In addition to site tours and panel discussions, we investigate areas of financial need and explore solutions to address them, similar to the points that Malachi raised in his presentation. Last spring, we partnered with the Urban Land Institute to conduct a two and a half day charrette where we brought 12 local and national experts together. You can see them pictured in the bottom right. And we asked them to advise us in bringing low cost energy efficiency financing to affordable housing. The report from that study has served as a powerful foundation for engaging national capital providers and bringing federal and private investment to Kansas City. And lastly, through the support of a local foundation dedicated to entrepreneurship, we worked with three fabulous program partners to develop an accelerator that positions diverse businesses for growth in clean energy construction. The Rising Trades Contractor Accelerator, as we titled it, provides business counsel and connections through an eight-month cohort model. We provide 40 hours of back office support, such as estimating, accounting, and legal services. We conduct several one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, connect them with mentors, and give opportunities to network with potential business leads. We also provide our business owners with a clean energy growth plan where we identify scopes of work where they are skilled and experienced, and we pair that with complementary scopes in high performance buildings. For example, electricians would be connected to opportunities in solar, electric vehicles, and panel upgrades that might be required for HVAC re replacements. We graduated four construction firms before the holidays this year, and we just launched our second cohort with 11 construction firms in total. We attribute our growth to the positive testimonies provided by our graduates and the expertise of our project team to support both business health and high performance building opportunities. As we look towards the future, despite the size of our city and the political headwinds we might encounter here in the Midwest, uh, we think the establishment of a building energy hub makes us well positioned to take advantage of federal funding opportunities and transform our buildings over the next decade. 
So thank you so much for hearing about what we're doing here in Kansas City and I'll send it back to you, Marla. Thank you so much, Ashley. Wow, so not only are we transforming buildings, we're also transforming people's lives. I mean, it's amazing. Thank you so much. That's such an inspiring program. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go back up north and we're gonna talk to Brian Imus from the Illinois Green Alliance in Chicago. So Brian, before you get started, do you have a favorite podcast you'd like to share? I do. Uh, Curious City. They take questions from ordinary Chicagoans about things they've always wondered about. Things like what makes Chicago prime real estate for geese? Uh, what's the history of Chicago potholes? And um, what was the environmental impact of reversing the Chicago River? Um, apologies to Malachi and everyone downriver from Chicago. Uh, so as Marla was saying, I'm Brian Imus. I serve as the executive director of the Illinois Green Alliance, and we are not a hub, but uh, we have acted as a convener of the building industry for 20 years, and we serve as the local voice for the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, over that time, through the professional education that we provide, the policy and advocacy work that we do, and through a lot of the community service engagement projects uh, that we conduct, we've really uh, built up a great community and really uh, valuable relationships with a broad network of stakeholders who are interested in green building. And about five years ago, we learned about um, BEX and what they were doing out there in New York City. And we decided to do some research and figure out if there was a benefit to formalizing uh, the concept of a hub for Chicago stakeholders. And if so, um, how do we bring the concept to Chicago? And how do we make sure that when we're doing that, that it um, aligns with the current work of Illinois Green and our strategic plan? Um, to formalize that research, we were fortunate to partner with BEX and IMT in doing a needs assessment and a business plan. Um, what you see there on the left are the takeaways from the needs assessment. Nothing too shocking or surprising, um, big takeaways, there's a lot of um, robust things happening in clean energy, energy efficiency, uh, 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 and building decarbonization. But uh, we heard a lot about how it was a really confusing marketplace for all of those tools and resources. It was hard to find what you needed. Um, and in particular, we heard a lot from um, folks who are owners or developers that there just isn't good research uh, to make the case around the ROI for building decarbonization and that that was really, really important. On the right hand side, what you see um, are the recommendations on exactly how we would go about uh, the best ways to go about building a hub here in Chicago and for the Chicago market. Um, two of the takeaways I want to highlight are the bullet points that are there. Um, first, that the hub should be a project of Illinois Green Alliance. That makes sense, but it should be branded with its own identity um, and website. And I'll explain a little bit when I talk about the audience why that's so important. And then second, the hub should be policy agnostic. So it should really be a safe space when um, building professionals are taking advantage of the resources and tools like around um, compliance with existing law, that they should feel like it's a safe space um, for getting the information that they really need. Um, last point I want to make uh, on what's happening in Illinois. We've been fortunate in the last two years to have policy efforts that make the need for a hub all the more important. Uh, the state passed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act uh, that includes uh, a lot of uh, funding around clean energy, um, a lot of changes to building codes, uh, um, and a lot of other um, funding around workforce development training related to green building. And then uh, the city of Chicago recently released 26 recommendations on how to approach building decarbonization in the city. And that included a recommendation for a building performance standard. So uh, while the hub would operate as an independent project of Illinois Green, it serves Illinois Green's strategic goals of advancing net zero buildings by more effectively reaching new audiences. So this slide was developed as part of our business plan, and it is helping us make clear what programs and services uh, in advancing our work should be branded as Illinois Green and which should be branded um, as a resource and a project of the, um, of the uh, building hub. 
Um, put very simply, and I'm kind of kind of overstated, but Illinois Grain's existing network is really essentially the choir. Um, those in the building industry that are already really passionate about building decarbonization and they want to connect um, with others um, to learn and to share their experience. The hub is our strategy to prioritize the developers, the owners, the contractors, and the building operators who are often decision makers, but aren't predisposed or interested in green building. So it's our chance to reach that other 95% of folks in the building industry that we need to reach to truly advance our building decarbonization goals in the region. Um, and the hub is also a way to convene unlikely stakeholders um, that we don't typically engage, um, like community and equity-based organizations um, that could be partners in reaching buildings that are often overlooked. Um, this is this slide in particular has been very, very helpful as we've been educating our longtime supporters and uh, board members on how this project is different um, and is filling a need um, that's critical here in Chicago. So we're ready to launch a hub here in Northeastern Illinois uh, this summer. The most important to the hub's launch and first year success is convening key players who can partner on content help us develop the new tools that are needed and can connect us to the, um, uh, connect the hub to the audience that it's really intended to serve. While there's a lot of program content, the intention for year one uh, is high impact and high visibility content at a low cost, because we're just launching, um, that really effectively communicates clearly why we launched this hub um, and who it's intended to serve. A key strategy to making that happen in the first year is just building meaningful partnerships with other players in the industry um, and in the public sector. So for example, um, we will be partnering with a lending agency as one of our very first education programs to educate owners about PACE and other financing solutions. Uh, and then the, the business plan also includes longer term goals over the course of four years on how to expand the programming and something I'm particularly excited about actually having a physical space to act as a uh, as a physical convener of everybody in the building industry that's interested in this work. So stay tuned for some exciting hub activity um, coming from Illinois later this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. We're excited about that official launch. Uh, and also, thank you for sharing how you've integrated uh, your hub work in with your Illinois Green work. I think that's uh, really helpful for any, particularly any existing nonprofits that might be considering this. So thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, really quick, before we move to Q&A, we've got one final polling question. Uh, so we would love to know uh, if you have any thoughts about what might be the biggest challenges to your city or region to uh, create a hub. Uh, and this is one where you can check all that apply. So just take a second to take a look at these and um, we would love to know your thoughts. Okay, so it's uh, really super interesting, uh, a little bit of everything, right? Which of course you would expect, um, but that's super helpful. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you for uh, participating in our polling question. That helps us a lot. Okay, so now how are we doing on time? So we, uh, excellent, we've got a few minutes left for questions. So uh, let's check in with Ella. So Ella would love to hear what kind of questions we've uh, had from the audience. Yeah, thanks Marla. We've had some amazing questions. Thank you all for asking those in our Q&A. Um, let's start off with a kind of general question of what has been the biggest challenge in setting up a hub? Um, and feel free, whoever has an answer first, to just jump in. I'll jump in. Um, and other panelists, I'm interested to hear your perspectives too. So the DC Hub, you know, as I said, we've, we've been around for two and a half years, but obviously a lot of work went into it before then. And I think in that time, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, we also, and you know, I'm, it's not it's not cheesy truly to say that I think a lot of these challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, are actually really opportunities if we can learn from these lessons and we can do things differently. Um, we have learned in particular that one challenge, but also something that's really, really important is a continuous feedback loop. Um, 
in order to be successful and support the industry, we need to know what the industry needs and we need to keep track of those changing needs and we need to respond quickly. So an extensive needs assessment that is continuously updated and continuous input from community industry and advocacy is, is challenging but very necessary because it results in a hub that best supports the priorities of the city or state. Another lesson, another challenge and lesson and opportunity is to cast a wide net. I think stakeholders, hub stakeholders are diverse, cities are diverse, and the priorities are diverse. And so co-creating and collaborating with a diverse audience is going to establish the direction that is most effective and will have the biggest impact. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, and we have another question that is focused on St. Louis and Kansas City. So someone would like to know if the cities were planning to create hubs before the initiation of the projects or did they initiate separately? What was that process like? Ashley, I don't know if you want to pitch in because you've been involved a little longer than I have, but my understanding is that both municipalities had already started the process of creating hubs when they learned of that project in the other city effectively, which is really kind of cool, but goes to show that um, you can work with your friends, right? <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll let Ashley add some context to that. Yeah, I would just add that um, one of the great assets that both Malachi and I have is um, a particular board member, and I'm going to give a shout out to him, Ashok Gupta, who um, lives in Kansas City, works a lot in St. Louis as well. Um, he was integral to forming the Building Energy Exchange in New York, as well as a lot of other parts of the New York ecosystem over a decade ago. He just happens to live in Kansas City now, so we um, get the wealth of his experience and institutional knowledge here. So um, I, I do want to give some credit to him because he was able to ask the right questions at the right time and in coordination with Climate Action KC and the Missouri Gateway chapter, it really resonated and led to us forming at the same time. We literally created our websites together. We, we've been attached to the hip since the beginning. So um, yeah, appreciate that cross, uh, cross the state partnership. Yeah, and could you both speak a little bit more to the motivation of how you both wanted to get started in launching a hub? I know that was another follow up question someone had. So um, I think it's important to recognize that in St. Louis, a lot of the effort was centered on the city's adoption of a BPS, which is raised the question of how do you get work to happen on the ground, especially when you have building owners that are focused on everything else they're doing to run their business, maybe don't even reside here and have property management companies. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's a piece of footwork that has to happen on the ground. There has to be um, connection to all of the other work that's happening. I saw another question lower down in the chat was asking about existing um, nonprofits working on this. Yeah, there, there are a lot of nonprofits, there are a lot of groups working in this space. Nobody is working fully collaboratively because we all have so much work to do. So the position of a hub in a metro like St. Louis is really to, to play connector. I mean, we can see the efforts that someone is, is doing over here and we can plug them into something else happening over there and create a little bit of additional capacity for everybody. And so the benefit of the city's adoption of, of our BEPS is that the entire region now gets a resource and, and the companies don't you know, build a wall between the city and the county and say, we don't work there. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth traffic already in the industry. And so it's just ensuring that everybody has access to these things and everybody knows how to do these things. Um, Ashley, I'll go. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that um, when we, first started, we did a, a very lengthy needs assessment, not just with our audience, but also understanding what the existing nonprofit ecosystem looked like to support what we're doing. Um, that led me, as well as the other nonprofits, um, to come to an agreement around where we could be focused. And one of those pieces is around financing and the level to which providing handholding and additional funding resources is really critical. It also spoke to the background of myself as the director. I'm an architect and urban planner. I spent most of my career in the real estate industry. Um, so that 
I brought to the table in a way that was not present um, in our ecosystem. So I will just want to iterate, as you probably have noticed, there's a lot of different experience and skill sets from each of these directors, and they each bring their own flavor and uh, value to this conversation. One final thought on that, just, just for fun. Uh, there are a lot of architects in this conversation. I'm an engineer. We agree on this. This is not normal. So pay attention to what we're saying. Thank you both so much. Um, I would love to pass a question to Katie. So BX New York City has the longest standing hub. And what do you think has been part of um, the deep New York City's hub's success? Sure. Um... Yeah, I will say, you know, one thing is that New York is obviously very, you know, leading edge with regards to some of the climate policy and whatnot that's already in place. So that is a helpful foothold when you have um, regulations driving and making things urgent. That's helpful. That's not the only reason. Um, we have a very diverse, you know, whether it's, you know, commercial or residential, um, different size, different populations, there's there's a lot, a large need um, to demystifying um, technical regulations, clarifying um, policies and standards, helping folks understand particular systems and whatnot. So, Taking that, being in a position where we can um, take technical information again, wherever it's coming from, and putting it through a lens that makes it digestible and accessible, visually appealing, it's really helpful to then um, to to make change. Once people understand things better, it's helpful then to take it to the next level. So I think one of the things that we have prioritized and really try to advocate for is um is again taking technical information and making it uh digestible and also doing it in various forms whether we create you know uh and produce a particular document resource um we also put our uh resources online we then have launch events so there's a lot of uh energy that is put into uh generating these resources in various forms and then also not just putting them up on the shelf doing the legwork to make sure if you create something but people have to know that it's out there so then doing the extra work um to really have the industry be aware with it aware of it and engage with it so that then we can also refine it and make it better is something um i think that has been uh helpful to our our hub and work in the community. That makes so much sense. Yeah. And I, are you wanting to talk more or less, pass it off to no, you? I was going to say we are, we are almost out of time. We've got like one minute. So like one minute question, we'll take a, a final one and then we'll close it out. Okay. I would love to pass it to Brian. Um, I know that you are, you know, most in the weeds right now with in the process of starting a hub. What has that been like for you, Brian? Um, and is there any words of advice you would give to cities or jurisdictions looking to start a hub? Uh, I think it's all about being on the ground and getting taking the time that it takes to get to know the lay of the land. I think we're fortunate because we've been here for 20 years. And I, I did see the question about just some skepticism about you know starting up a hub when there's such a robust network of nonprofits that are implementation based that's raising one of my biggest concerns i want to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel and that the hub is truly serving um, first and foremost a way to take advantage of and connect um, so much that's already happening to the to the to the community and the stakeholders that need it and so for us, the biggest thing that we've been doing has been uh, just one-on-one -on -one meetings about the hub before we launch with key stakeholders uh, that are already doing this work. That includes the city of Chicago, that includes our, our building and owner manager association chapter here. It includes other nonprofits like Slipstream and Elevate, and it includes our, our utility as well. That's great. And uh, and that's when the, the process of the needs assessment also uh, helps uh, to determine that as well. 
So uh, I can't believe we're out of time already. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ella. Thank you, panelists. And thank you, audience, for your participation today. Um, so just remember, if you would like more information on developing a hub for your city or jurisdiction, you can email any of today's speakers. If you just have any general questions about hubs, you can email Ella and she will help make sure to get you an answer. Also, keep an eye out for that hub guidance document I told you about that'll be provided in the follow up email for this webinar, along with the slides and recording link. And don't forget to check out chapter eight of the BPS implementation guide. There's a whole chapter dedicated to creating a high performance building hub in there. And uh, just as we close out, mark your calendars. There's upcoming webinars for the BPS series that you can see listed here. Also keep an eye out for upcoming program from the BPP Hub Network. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.